afternoon. This is Kristen O'Neill with the Committee on Open Government. I just want to acknowledge all that were present already and let you know that we'll start um, right on time at 2 p.m. Uh, we will have a couple more people joining us. If you have questions as we go along, you're welcome to add them into the chat feature. Uh, as uh, if you ask a question that's already been addressed, I may skip over it during the end of the program, um, but I will be waiting until the end of the program to answer answer questions. Let's see the recording of the program as well as the PowerPoint slides uh, will be added to the Committee on Open Government's website. Uh, hopefully they should be there by the end of the week. There is a version of the slides posted currently, but it's not the most up-to-date version. So I will get that posted as quickly as possible. So I'm just going to mute for a few more minutes and then we'll get started right at two. Thank you.
Good afternoon. This is Kristen O'Neill, the Assistant Director of the New York State Committee on Open Government. Uh, this afternoon, we are presenting, doing an information session on the New York State Open Meetings Law. We'll talk about, give an overview of the statute, but also focus a little bit on the recent updates, specifically regarding video conferencing. This, as I mentioned earlier to people that had logged on a little bit earlier, this program is being recorded and will be posted on our website. We have a link to training materials and recordings right from the home page of our website. Uh, so copies of the slides, uh, updated version of the slides. I hope to have those also posted by the end of the week. Um, in addition to the uh, recording of today's program. Uh, so, if you are looking to share this with people that may not have had the opportunity to uh, log on this afternoon, uh, you should be able to find it by the end of the week. On the screen now, you'll find my name and email address. Uh, if you have a question for me specifically, maybe regarding something I specifically said during the program, you're welcome to email me. Our phone number for the office is included. It's 518-474-2518, along with our website, www.opengovernment.ny.gov. When you call our office with questions about the Freedom of Information Law or the Open Meetings Law, you can speak with any attorney. It does not need to be me. Any of the attorneys in the office can assist you with your questions regarding the Freedom of Information Law or the Open Meetings Law. Um, so feel free just to ask to speak with an attorney with one of your questions. I also, at the end of this program, I will include our general email address, uh, which is coog, C-O-O-G, at dos.ny.gov, but it's it's on the last slide uh, for people that didn't get a chance to write that down. Uh, in, a, in addition to being able to email me, uh, emailing that gen general email box is a good way of getting a fast response from one of the attorneys in the office. So the New York State Open Meetings Law is codified in Public Officers Law, Article 7. Uh, we always have an up-to-date version of the statute right on our website. So if you're looking to see what the statute itself says, you can go right to our homepage. At the top of the screen, you'll see menu items for the Freedom of Information Law, menu items for the Open Meetings Law, and you can find a copy of the text of the Open Meetings Law. Um, you'll find a link to it right from our homepage. So when the Open Meetings Law was passed in 1976, the declared legislative intent stated that it is essential that public business be performed in public of public officials. Citizens have the right to attend and listen to the deliberations and decisions that go into the making of public policy. Uh, as many of you that are on this program are aware that for the past couple of years, there's been <clears throat> some changes, some temporary amendments to the open meetings law regarding the use of video conferencing and regarding and with regard to the ability to hold fully remote meetings while there was uh, the COVID uh, public health emergency was in place. The statute that amended the open meetings law to allow for fully remote meetings uh, was linked to executive order 11, which declared the COVID state of emergency. And the statute, which was chapter one of the laws of 2022, was set to expire when executive order 11 expired. That expired on September 12th, I believe. Uh, sometimes I keep getting the, the date mixed up, but it was the, I believe it was September 12th. So starting in mid-September of, um, of 2022, the state as a whole did no longer had uh, the ability, a blanket ability to hold fully remote meetings um, and to bar in-person public attendance at their meetings. In April of this year, 
Governor Hochul signed Chapter 56 of the laws of 2022, and this was part of the New York State uh, budget for the 22-23 fiscal year. So included in the budget bill was an amendment to the open meetings law to make semi-permanent, meaning that it's in place now until July 1st, 2024, the expanded use of video conferencing by public bodies to conduct open meetings under extraordinary circumstances, regardless of a declaration of emergency. So as a threshold matter, it is our understanding that the new amendments is not new amendment to the law is not meant to change or curtail what has always been required of public bodies complying with the open meetings law. Public bodies may continue to operate now as they did before the onset of the pandemic in early 2020 when the in person aspects of the open meetings law were first suspended. In other words, we believe that if a public body was permitted to do it before the pandemic, this law does not change that. As noted above, this law is intended to expand in extraordinary circumstances only the ability of a public body to meet using remote access technology. So I'll continue to refer to chapter 56. Chapter 56 was the, uh, was the statute, that was the bill that uh, amended, uh, was the legislation, excuse me, that amended the open meetings law to add section 103-A. So chapter 56 added new language to the open meetings law and that new language is located primarily in section 103-A of the open meetings law. So now with the addition of chapter 56, there are two ways to use video conferencing technology to conduct an open meeting. One is where you're connecting multiple physical locations that are open to in-person public attendance. And this is the provision that has all that has existed for quite some time since prior to the start of the pandemic. You could have, for example, the New York State Committee on Open Government uh, would have meeting locations in Albany and Buffalo in New York City. Our members were invited to attend at the location that was closest to them. And all three of those locations would be open to the public, would be included in the in the meeting notice, and they would be connected through the use of, of video conferencing. That has always been allowed and continues to be allowed. Uh, the second method is the method that is added by the new legislation. And that is where a public body can allow a member of a public body to participate from a private location, a location that is not open to the public through video conferencing under extraordinary circumstances. If a public body is using the first type of video conferencing, that is you're connecting multiple physical locations that are open to the public, the new section 103A of the open meetings law does not apply. Section 103A, 2A states that a public body may, in its discretion, use video conferencing to conduct its meetings pursuant to the requirements of this article provided that a minimum number of members are pre present to fulfill the public body's quorum requirements in the same physical location or locations where the public can attend and the following criteria are met. So this is important because you have to have a quorum of your public body present in at least in one or more open locations, locations that are open to the public that are included in the meeting notice and where the public are allowed to attend. If you don't have a quorum present at open locations, you will not, a public body is not going to be uh, permitted to, uh, to take action and to meet. The governing board of a county, city, town, or village must adopt a local law and all other public bodies must adopt a resolution. Um, Senate and assemblies must adopt a joint resolution following a public hearing authorizing the use of this extraordinary circumstances video conferencing. The governing board 
uh, can adopt a local law for just itself or excuse me, it can do, adopt it for itself and all of its committees and subcommittees that it houses. Like, for example, use the example of a county legislature. In our view, a county legislature could pass a local law that uh, covers all of the public bodies that are housed by the county. And, and by that, I don't mean like physical locations within the county. I don't mean that a count, a lo, a, County can pay, pass a local law that will govern meetings that take place in the cities, towns, and villages that are within the county. What I mean is that the county legislature could pass a local law that applies to the county legislature, the county board of health, uh, the county ethics board, the county, you know, for example, anything where it's county officials, county employees serving on the public public body. And the alternative, uh, a public body, um, a governing body can specify that each committee or subcommittee can make its own determinations. Uh, the third option here, this Roman numeral three applies to a very specific type of entity called community boards that are located in New York City. And it states, the law states that each community board uh, located in New York City uh, is uh, can make its own, shall make its own determination as to whether it will adopt the use of extraordinary circumstances video conferencing. Chapter 56 states that the public body must establish written procedures governing member and public attendance consistent with this section and that those written procedures shall be conspicuously posted on the public website of the public body. If you're looking for any sort of guidance on this issue, the Committee on Open Government has a model uh, resolution and model policies uh, that are uh, available from our homepage. Members of the public body must be physically present at any such meeting unless the member is unable to be physically present due to extraordinary circumstances as set forth in the resolution and written procedures adopted pursuant to the open meetings law. Uh, those extraordinary circumstances can include disability, illness, caregiving responsibilities, or any other significant or unexpected factor or event which precludes the members physical attendance at such meeting. So, in other words, each public body can make a decision as to what they believe constitutes an extraordinary circumstance. Except in the case of executive sessions, the public body shall ensure that members of the public body can be heard, seen, and identified while the meeting is being conducted, including but not limited to any motions, proposals, resolutions, and any matter formally discussed or voted upon. So, this is this is new language, obviously, that relates to the use of extraordinary circumstances, but it also is interesting because I think it applies a little bit more broadly than that. Um, because a, a member that's participating via video conference clearly needs to have their cameras on at all times, or at least certainly um, it says while the meeting is conducted, but including but not limited to so, so in our view. While the meeting is going on, members of the public body should be should have their cameras on if they're using WebEx, Zoom, any sort of program like that. Um, while the previous iterations of the remote meeting authorization were in effect, teleconferencing was sufficient. That is no longer sufficient. Cameras need to be on. People need to be participating uh, with both video and audio feeds. So they uh, the members must be heard, seen, and identified. So another addition there is that when a member signs on to the video conference, for example, they should be entering their names, their first and last names, for example, when they log on to the program. Um, also, another option is to have name placards. So the members that might be at a physical location should have name placards so that uh, they can be identified. 
The new language of the law states that the minutes of the meeting involving extraordinary circumstances, video conferencing shall include which, if any, members participated remotely and should be available to the public pursuant to the current uh, requirements of the open meetings law. If extraordinary circumstances, video conferencing is used to conduct a meeting, the public notice for the meeting shall inform the public that video conferencing will be used where the public can view and or participate in such meeting where required documents and records will be posted or available and identify the physical location for the meeting where the public can attend. Public bodies shall provide that each meeting conducted using extraordinary circumstances video conferencing shall be recorded and such recording posted or linked on the public website of the public body within five business days following the meeting and shall remain so available for a minimum of five years thereafter. Recording shall be transcribed upon request. It's a little different from the previous iterations where it said um, where the law, re law or executive order required um, that meetings be later transcribed if they are being held remotely. Now the law states that the recording shall be transcribed upon request. If extraordinary circumstances, video conferencing is used to conduct a meeting, the public body shall provide the opportunity for members of the public to view such meeting via video and to participate in proceedings via video conference in real time where public comments or participation is authorized and shall ensure that video conferencing authorizes the same public participation or testimony as in-person participation or testimony. So this is an interesting change here. Previously, the open meetings law was pretty much completely silent regarding public participation. And still, the open meetings law continues. It does not require that a public body offer public participation or a time for public comment. Uh, it is, it's a time for the, the, the public has the right to attend and observe and listen, but there's no statutory right to participate in the meeting or to have a time for public comment. But what this law, what this amendment says is if you're going to allow a member of your public body to take advantage of the extraordinary circumstances video conferencing, you also need to make video conferencing available for the public. You need to give that same option of, uh, to members of the public. And in addition, if you allow members of the public to speak during privilege of the floor, during public comment time, if you allow the people that show up in person to participate in that public comment time, you need to afford the same opportunity for the individuals that are attending the meeting via video conferencing. Uh, the law states that a local public body electing to utilize video conferencing to conduct its meetings must maintain an official website. Um, I think they specified local public bodies here. The legislature specified local public bodies because all state Public bodies already have uh, agencies that can house their websites. There are still some local government entities, some smaller entities that do not have websites. Um, so if you are a local public body and would like to take advantage of the extraordinary circumstances video conferencing amendment, you as a public body uh, or the agency that houses your public body is going to make sure, need to make sure that it maintains an official website. This has been coming up uh, already. Uh, we've had some situations, particularly I think in New York City, where the New York City, there is a uh, local New York City based uh, state of emergency in place. There's a provision of the new amendment says that the in person participation requirements of the new new law shall not apply during a state disaster emergency declared by the governor or a local state of emergency proclaimed by the chief executive of a county, city, village, or town, but only if. So the state of emergency is not enough. It can't be just that there's a state of emergency. The public body must determine 
that the circumstances necessitating the emergency declaration would affect or impair the ability of the public body to hold an in person meeting. So, for example, we were getting questions about like there's a, a, a monkeypox state of emergency. There's a polio state of emergency, but the question really is and. Public body would need to defend itself in the case of an article 78 is whether the circumstances necessitating the particular emergency declaration would affect or impair the ability of the public body to hold an in person meeting. No later than January of 2024, our committee on open government is going to be required to issue a report to the governor and the legislature concerning the application and implementation of this amendment and any further recommendations governing the use of video conferencing by public bodies to conduct meetings pursuant to this section. So that will be an obligation on our part. So we will be looking for input from the public and from government agencies and public bodies that have had experience uh, letting us know how, how this is all working. Open meetings of any public body that are broadcast or that use video conferencing shall utilize technology to permit access by members of the public with disabilities consistent with the 1990 Americans with Disability Act. Uh, for purposes of this section, disability uh, is defined uh, in Executive Law Section 292. So that is my overview of the new parts, the new amendments to the Open Meetings Law. Now we're going to sort of backtrack and go uh, to uh, go back to an overview of the Open Meetings Law generally. So the Open Meetings Law governs the conduct of meetings of public bodies, and the term is defined as any entity for which a quorum is required in order to conduct public business, which consists of two or more members performing a governmental function for the state or agency or department thereof, or for a public corporation, or committee or subcommittee or other similar body consisting of members of the larger public body, or an entity created or appointed to perform a necessary function in the decision-making process for which a quorum is required in order to conduct public business and which consists of two or more members. This language is very dense. Um, everything that's underlined was added uh, a little less than a, a part of it was added in December of 2021. Uh, another part of it was added in February of 2022. Um, it, it's dense and it's a little bit confusing and it has um, raised some questions that we don't have all the answers to right now. Uh, I'll keep going. So, a necessary function in the decision making process shall not include the provision of recommendations or guidance, which is purely advisory which does not require further action by the state or agency or department thereof or public corporation is defined in section 66 of the general construction law. So if you're with me and thinking that is all very confusing and very verbose, uh, I get you. Um, the best thing to do is if you are a question, uh, if you have questions, uh, regarding whether any particular entity is in fact a public body that is subject to the open meetings law, that's what we're here for. We're here for you to reach out and ask those questions. These are the, some of the things that we look to, of course, the simpler questions that we ask, not that it's ever 100% simple, but have two or more people been given the authority to act collectively? Is a quorum necessary to conduct business? Is it a committee made up solely or primarily of members of the larger public body? Does the committee serve a state statutory function? Or is the entity purely advisory in nature with no statutory duties or final decision making authority? These are the questions that we ask ourselves to try to figure out whether an entity is in fact a public body or not. Notice somebody just asked the question in comments. Sometimes things pop up and I, my corner of my eye catches them about how to determine what a quorum is. Well, so that's where we are right now. Uh, general construction law defines the term uh, quorum 
and it states that whenever three or more public officers are given any power or authority, or three or more persons are charged with any public duty to be performed or exercised by them jointly or as a board or similar body, a majority of the whole number of such persons or officers gathered together in the presence of each other or through the use of video conferencing shall constitute a quorum and not less than a majority of the whole number may perform and exercise such power, authority, or duty. For the purpose of this provision, the words whole number shall be construed to mean the total number which the body would have where there are no vacancies and where none of the persons or officers disqualified from acting. So let's use a real life example. We have an 11 member committee on open government. A majority of the whole number uh, that are should be appointed to the committee on open government is six. So in order for the committee on open government to to meet and to take any action, you would need six members present and you would need the approval of, of six members in order to pass any action. Uh, right now, we're, we're missing a couple of people. We have two of the uh, two of the spots on the committee on, on open government are not filled. There are vacancies on the committee on open government. So right now we only have nine members. It doesn't matter. A quorum of the committee on open government is always going to be six, regardless of the number of people that are currently serving on the committee. So members are participating from a physical location that has been properly noticed and is open to in-person public attendance do count towards a quorum and may fully participate and vote. Members who are video conferencing from a remote location that is not open to in-person public attendance do not count towards a quorum. They may, however, fully participate and vote if a quorum has otherwise been met. Notice the date, time, and location, and if appropriate, instructions for virtual attendance must be given prior to every meeting to the media. You do not need to purchase a, a public body does not need to purchase a legal notice. It's just that notice needs to be given to the media. The notice must be placed in a designated physical location. And if the agency slash public body has an active website, the information of the notice must be posted on that website. Notice must be given at least 72 hours prior to a meeting that has been scheduled at least one week in advance. So for regularly scheduled meetings, notice must be provided at least 72 hours in advance. For a meeting held on short notice, notice must be given to the extent practicable at a reasonable time prior to the meeting. The open meetings law is silent as to when a public body is allowed to have a meeting on short notice, but the courts have weighed in and the courts have suggested that the propriety of scheduling a meeting less than a week in advance and providing less than 72 hours notice is dependent upon the actual need to do so. If extraordinary circumstances video conferencing is used to conduct a meeting, the public notice for the meeting shall inform the public that video conferencing will be used, where the public can view and or participate in such meeting, where required documents and records will be posted and or will be available, and must identify the physical location or locations for the meeting where the public can attend. On October 19th of 2021, so almost a year ago, Governor Hochul signed into law Chapter 481 of the Laws of 2021. This law amended Section 103 of the Open Meetings Law. So this recent amendment, this recent uh, Chapter 481, was simply an amendment to an existing requirement. Uh, my experience after this law was passed was that many public bodies did not were not aware that there was an existing requirement relating to records scheduled to be discussed during an open meeting. 
all of a sudden we were getting a million inquiries, hyperbole there, of course, I, but we were getting inquiries left, right, and center about what, what constitutes a record schedule to be discussed and what do we need to do? Do we have to have a website? A million questions about this as if this obligation had never existed before. But really, all Chapter 481 of the laws of 2021 did was add a 24-hour time uh, limit. So it's now it states that the records that are scheduled to be discussed at a meeting must be made available to the extent practical upon request and posted online at least 24 hours before the meeting. So the obligation to make records available to the public upon request prior to or at the meeting and to post the records on the agency or public body website prior to the meeting has been in effect since February of 2012. This amendment simply places a 24 hour minimum time frame for making those records available. So here, when we're talking about record schedule to be discussed, we're talking about proposed resolutions, laws, rules, regulations, policies, or any amendments to any of those types of items. In addition, it's records or portions of records that would be public under the freedom of information law. And it's so the records that are scheduled to be discussed by the public body. They must be made available upon request at least 24 hours prior to the meeting and available online at least 24 hours prior to the meeting. If the agency maintains a regularly and routinely updated website and utilizes a high speed internet connection. Minutes. Minutes of an open meeting must include a record or summary of all motions, proposals, resolutions, or any other matter formally voted upon and the votes thereon. If extraordinary circumstances video conferencing is used, the minutes must include which, if any, members participated remotely. A public body is only required to prepare minutes of an executive session if action is taken in executive session. So if a public body enters into executive session, but only discusses, but does not vote, no separate minutes of the executive session must be prepared. However, if a public body discusses and votes, the public body is going to be required to prepare minutes of that executive session. And those minutes must be available within two weeks of an open session and one week for an executive session. And it does not matter whether the minutes are unapproved or in draft form. Once they've been prepared, they must be made available upon request. On, no <clears throat> excuse me, on November 8th of 2021, Governor Hochul signed into law chapter 587 of the laws of 21, which amended the open meetings law to require agencies that maintain a website and use a high speed internet connection to post meeting minutes on its website within two weeks of the date of the meeting or one week of the executive session. The law further states that for purposes of this subdivision, and that's important, I'm pointing out that I underlined for purposes of this subdivision. For purposes of the subdivision, unabridged video recordings or unabridged audio recordings or unabridged written transcripts may be deemed to be meeting minutes. The reason why I say that's important is because this provision does not relieve a public body of the obligation to prepare meeting minutes. All it's saying is that instead of posting meeting minutes within two weeks of the meeting, you can instead, as a public body, post an unabridged video or audio recording or an unabridged transcript instead of posting the meeting minutes. But you still, as a public body, need to prepare the meeting minutes. This does not relieve you of that obligation. Recording. Any meeting of a public body that is open to the public shall be open to being photographed, broadcast, webcast, or otherwise recorded and or transmitted by audio or video mean, means. Um, so any member of the public that walks into an open meeting of a public body is allowed to record, uh, to photograph, record, broadcast, webcast, uh, and they don't need the public body's permission. They don't need to provide advance notice. An agency is not obligated to record unless the member is participating remotely under Section 103A. An agency can establish reasonable rules to limit disruption and interference, and we have model rules uh, on, our, on our website 
um, relating to recording. Executive session. Executive session is defined in section 1023 of the open meetings law as a portion of an open meeting that is not open to the public. So it's important to note that this is a portion of an open meeting and it is not prior to or separate from an open meeting. A public body cannot have a standalone executive session uh, without being held within the context of an open meeting. A motion to enter into executive session must be made and voted upon during an open meeting. And the motion must be specific enough to reflect to your fellow board members and to the public that you are entering into executive session for a proper purpose. It does not need to be so specific that it defeats the purpose of the executive session, but it should be detailed enough so that the public knows that you're going in for a proper purpose. So the motion must be made and the vote on the motion must be held during an open meeting. So you'll see up here we have, these are the reasons that a public body can go into executive session. I'm not gonna discuss all of them in detail, but I'll discuss some of the more common ones um, for people that may not be looking at the PowerPoint uh, that, or just listening, just know that this information is available uh, on our slides uh, that are available on the website. Um, so the, the concept really is similar to how under the freedom of information law, there's a presumption of access where all records are public unless you can assert one of the permissible statutory grounds for denial where harm would be caused by disclosure. Same is sort of true of the open meetings law. There's a presumption that all discussions of a uh, public body should be held in an open setting unless the members of the public body can assert a reason for entering into executive session, can uh, describe, take one of the reasons that is established by the statute uh, to, uh, to sort of defend why they need to have this conversation behind closed doors that some type of harm would be caused. The first thing I always like to tell public bodies when we're doing trainings is please don't ever use the term word personnel um, when making a motion to enter into executive session. Do not say I move to enter into executive session to discuss personnel matters. Uh, it's just the, the word personnel does not appear in the open meetings law. What the law does allow is a public body to enter into executive session to discuss the medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or corporation or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person or corporation. So as you'll note, it's much more specific. It has to the discussion that the public body wants to have has to relate to either a particular person or persons or a particular corporation or corporations. In cor the example of corporations may come up if there is a request for proposals. If a municipality or some type of public body uh, puts out a request for proposals and the public body would like to discuss the uh, medical financial credit or employment history of a particular corporation that has submitted a proposal in response to the RFP, or it's a matter leading to the appointment of a particular corporation to fill a particular need within the municipality. Those are permissible reasons to enter into executive session. Uh, discussing applicants for employment uh, is an appropriate uh, discussion to be held in executive session. You're discussing uh, the probably the employment history of multiple particular people. You're having a conversation leading uh, about matters leading to the employment or appointment of a particular person. Public body can have discussions relating to disciplinary matters in executive session. But the point of me going into all of this is it's important for the public body to be as specific as possible in their motion to enter into executive session without defeating the purpose of the executive session. Say I'm entering into executive session to discuss a disciplinary matter relating to a particular employee, but you don't have to identify the employee, just that it's relating to a particular employee. Uh, there are two mechanisms for meeting behind closed doors. 
Uh, the first is uh, the first is executive session, as we've already discussed. The second is exemptions. Section 108 of the open meetings law is the second mechanism for meeting behind closed doors. If an exemption under section 108 applies, the open meetings law does not. It is as if the open meetings law does not exist. And there are three exemptions. The first is judicial or quasi judicial proceedings, except for proceedings of the public service commission and zoning boards of appeals. The second is deliberations of political committees, conferences and caucuses. So, if you have a 5 member town board with 5 Republicans and 2 Democrats, those, even though they constitute a quorum, those 5 Republicans can meet behind closed doors. Those meetings are exempt from the open meetings law. They just can't vote. They can talk about whatever they want, but they can't vote. Um, the 3rd exemption is any matter made confidential by federal or state law. Uh, for example, discussions relating to students that are made confidential by FERPA or meeting with an agency attorney that is covered by the attorney client privilege. Very frequently, um, let me back up a little. I just want to show you. On this slide, you'll see that 1 of the reasons for entering into executive session is to discuss have discussions regarding proposed pending or current litigation. That's item D in this uh, section 105. It's discussions regarding proposed pending or current litigation. So here, if you make a motion to enter into executive session, it is ideal that you identify the litigation that you're discussing. The purpose of this is to uh, perhaps discuss litigation strategy. Um, maybe you're going to discuss whether you want to, a public body wants to settle a particular case or pursue can continue to pursue the case in court. Those are the types of things that you may discuss in executive session where some type of harm would be caused to the agency or public body if uh, um, the if the agency um, had the conversations in public. So that's executive session. The exemption that I'm talking about here, where you can have a conversation that is made confidential by state law behind closed doors, is a conversation where the agency or public body's attorney is playing an active role in providing legal advice. It does not have to relate to litigation, but it does have to involve the attorney playing an active role. The mere presence of an attorney in the room is not going to trigger the attorney client privilege. It has to be where the public body is requesting legal advice and the attorney is providing legal advice. So those are the three exemptions. Non compliance and enforcement enforcement the committee on open government is authorized to provide advice and legal opinions regarding the freedom of information law and the open meetings law. We do not have investigatory authority and we do not have enforcement authority. So if you have concerns about your local town or village board, whatever the case may be, oh, we can answer your questions and we can provide you guidance, but we can't, we can't compel those public bodies to do something. Um, we can't issue counseling memos or slaps on the wrist. We can just give you information and then you have the tools to decide what you want to do going forward. Enforcement of the open meetings law is through the initiation of a civil practice law and rules article 78 proceeding. The court has the authority to award to the petitioner costs and attorney's fees if they are there, if they prevail. Uh, an action can be invalidated by the courts if the uh, judge believes that the um, violation of the open meetings law was significant enough. Uh, it's going to, and, it, and action is likely going to be invalidated if um, it was taken at meetings held in substantial non-compliance with the open meetings law or resulted from deliberations that occurred from substantial non-compliance with the open meetings law. Not all technical violations are going to lead to an action being invalidated. It's going to 
a judge is likely only going to invalidate an action if they find some sort of substantial um, substantive uh, violations of the law. The law also includes as a penalty that a public body can be required to receive training um, from the Committee on Open Government. Uh, that is one of the pe penalties that a court can enforce, and here you all doing it voluntarily. At the beginning, I promised you an email address where you can reach out to the committee on any of the attorneys uh, in the Committee on Open Government for guidance. Um, as a reminder, anyone is welcome to contact our office by phone or by email with questions, whether you're a government employee, members of the public, media representatives. Our phone number is 518-474-2518. The email address that's best for questions that can be directed to anyone is coog, C-O-O-G, at D-O-S dot N-Y dot gov. So now I'm going to, so I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoint and I'm going to pull up the chat function to see if people have questions in the chat function that I can try to assist with. Um, I know I'm going to ask people just going forward if they have questions to put it in chat. So I'm not alternating back and forth, but I did notice one was put in Q and A. So I'm going to pull it up. The question is, would adopting the model resolution at an open meeting constitute a public hearing? Or is there an additional requirement to meet the after a public hearing? A public hearing generally involves the opportunity for the public to comment on something. I guess that's that's all I <laughs> that's all I have to offer on that. Um, if you are a if if it's a municipality, you need to follow the rules regarding passage of a local law, but if you are a anything other than a, a local government, a body, uh, like a, a county, a city, a town, village, if you're a school board or if you're fire district, library board of trustees, you just want to cons going to want to consult with your own legal counsel to determine what, if any, legal obligations you have regarding a hearing, but the essence is, is that a public hearing is the opportunity for the public to speak. All right, back to. Someone asked about what proportion of members must be present to be considered achieving quorum. We already discussed that. The next is where does section 103A state that its application is limited to extraordinary circumstances video conferencing? Um, I mean, this is a good question, but the the assumption that this is our interpretation. Uh, they talk about this section 103A specifically relates to the use of video conferencing um, under extraordinary circumstances. So it has been our understanding and the guide and our interpretation is that the entire section of 103A relates to extraordinary circumstances. It's a very long comment, but I'm... Um... Sorry. Another question is, what if a public meeting has a walk on agenda item that was not announced to the public, but the presenters were clearly noticed in advance? Public has no way to request the documents in advance or during the meeting and the agenda and records have never been updated to show that the walk on took place, not 24 hours. I mean, this is a very factually specific. I, you know, of course, I have no way of knowing what any particular public body did or did not know, but it's to the extent practicable. If they had the ability, if the public body had the ability to make a record available that they knew that they were planning to discuss, that's what they should do. Um, so I, I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't know how to be more specific than that because really it's a very, it's a very factually specific question. Um, if they are not complying with the requirement of making records that they scheduled to discuss available prior to the meeting that enforcement is through an article 78 proceeding. Let's see. So, 
someone wants to know what the governing body of a state agency is, I, I think it's probably it, with, with the state agency, it's it's the head. Uh, I have to go back to what slide nine was. Hold on a second. I'm not sure what slide nine was. It says the governing board of a county, city, town, or village must adopt a local law or a public body must adopt a resolution. So a state agency is not a public body. A, a state agency is an agency. There are public bodies housed by state agencies. So, for example, the Committee on Open Government is a public body housed um, administratively within the Department of State. Department of State is an agency. The Committee on Open Government is a public body. Um, we are not. The Committee on Open Government is not a governing board. Um, Section 9 Pull this aside here. Slide nine says the governing board of a county, city, town, or village must adopt a local law. And then it says, or a public body must adopt a resolution. So all public bodies that are not governing boards of counties, cities, towns, or villages must adopt resolutions, whereas governing boards of counties, cities, towns, or villages have to adopt a local law. Um, I think that's all I have away in terms of questions. Um, I don't see anything else popping up in my chat feature. Oh, hold on, maybe more coming in late. Or just popping in. Uh, someone says, can you comment on the use of items on a consent agenda? Or agreement on consent? I guess I would just, I, if people are putting things in chat, I just ask that it's, that there be a specific question. Because I'm, I'm not really understanding what's being requested, what's being asked here. If a public body is meeting remotely due to a state disaster emergency or local state of emergency, do the other requirements of 103A apply? If a public body generally meets in person, can it meet remotely during a state of emergency, even if it has not adopted a resolution per 103A? Uh, in my opinion, if there is a local state or local state of emergency, and the public body has determined that the circumstances necessitating the state of emergency impair your ability to host a meeting, I think you can have a video conference meeting uh, regardless of whether you have adopted the resolution per 103A. Do I know that for sure? No, because it hasn't been litigated yet. And it, the, the language of the statute is not 100% clear, but I do believe that you could have a remote meeting uh, through the use of video conferencing if your state of emergency impairs your ability to have in-person meetings. Um, I'm not sure what other requirements of 103A we're talking about. Um, do I think you should record and later transcribe the meeting? Yes. I think if you're not having an in-person meeting, you're going to want to do all of the other things that the law required, that 103A requires. But again, it's not 100% clear. The statute is not 100% clear. Okay, that is all I have right now. I appreciate everyone uh, logging on today. If you have follow up questions about specifically about something that I said during this program, you're welcome to email me directly. If you just have questions about the freedom of information law or the open meetings law uh, generally, you're welcome to contact and speak to, to anyone in the office. And uh, I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you for joining me today.